Welcome to the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. We're so glad you've taken the time to listen, and we pray this message from our pastors will be a blessing on your life this week. If you have your Bibles today, I encourage you to open up to the book of Acts. Are you shocked? All right. If you've been keeping track, we're on week 10 of uh, our Acts study, and we're in actually Acts chapter 10 this week. Um, and what I'm preaching on today, I would not be reading the entirety of Acts chapter 10 and 11, but what I'm telling you is the context of basically the entirety of Acts chapter 10 and 11. Uh, I, I put a little Facebook thing out there yesterday. I don't know that that enticed any of you to make sure that you were here, but I'm just, I, I cannot tell you enough. This, this may be one of the coolest finds that I have ever found in the Word of God. And I am so thrilled and excited to get to preach to you today. First of all, I just want to go ahead and tell you, Acts chapter 10, you're not even in the story until Acts chapter 10. We don't come any Jewish people in the house. Okay. Then all of us, we don't even show... You're Jewish? Grab it in. Okay. All right. Grab it in. I figured. <laughs> Look, we... Until chapter 10, us Gentiles, us European seated folks, don't even enter into the story. We know that this was the perspective of Jesus from the very beginning. He says, go and tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power. And when, and when you're endued with power, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea. And to Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Well, we get excited about chapter 1 because we're the uttermost parts of the earth. At that group of time, they were so obscure, they had no idea who it was. They would have never thought that what took place in that little teeny hill over in Israel would ever impact things so much that an entire nation on the other side of the earth that didn't even know existed would be founded on principles that were based on what they were understanding from the Holy Spirit over there and that there would be a whole bunch of white folks sitting in churches on the other side of the earth believing in what had happened to them was for them as well. And y'all didn't grow up that way. We grew up thinking that the Holy Spirit was just as much for us as anybody else. I want you to understand it's the truth. But don't forget the sacrifices that it has taken to make sure that, that was true for us. At some point, the church had to open the door. At some point, the Jewish people had to chill out on their expectations so that we could be grafted in and be grown. And then may we also learn that we've got to grow up a little bit. And stop raising the standard on everybody outside the church in order for them to come inside the church. The ground should be very level for them to come into the house because it's level like a cross. Now we should heighten our expectations of leaders. I'm not telling us to lower our expectations of leaders or of workers or servants or once you get in here being discipled. We all need to grow. But for the person who's far away from the Lord, it should be as simple as deciding Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Y'all know it right now. That's the only thing we agree on anyway. <laughs> we could spend the rest of the day trying to find two things that we all agree on, and it would take us all day except for Jesus. Why do we make it hard on those outside the church to find their place in here? You may not feel like you're doing that. No, maybe you're not. Maybe we're not. But I know there was a bunch of years that I sat on pews here and I did not think I was good enough to sit on pews here. My Jesus died for my sloppy soul just like he did all you perfect saints. <laughs> I know y'all don't claim to be that. I'm just saying, I remember years thinking, I wish I would ever be as good. Uh, when I was coming here, when I was real little, it was like the holy the holy line was right here. You know, it was Brother Jarvis and then Brother Williams. And, I mean, the, then there were different other times where there was men of God that would sit up here. They always had the front. You know that? Anyway, it's not a point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Today we're going to Acts chapter 10. I'm going to read a lengthy piece of scripture. We're going to start at verse 17. 
I read the first part of this on Wednesday night, but I, I just want to catch you up to where we are in the story. So in the chapter 8, we see that Philip goes out and he begins to do ministry in Samaria. And then Peter comes along and makes sure that it's, it's working, it's real. So Peter puts his stamp of approval. Philip continues to go up the, the eastern sea, the western seaboard of uh, Mediterranean and continues to preach the gospel. And then Peter moves on and he continues to preach uh, 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 into Samaria. And then eventually he's going to go all the way up to Cornelius' house. Is what Cornelius was a, a Roman centurion over a group of guys called the Italian cohort. The, the Roman legion called the Italian cohort. There was some pride wrapped up in this dude. This guy was a man of clout, a man of power, a man of, of leadership. Before we even get there, uh, we see uh, that Saul, Paul, was converted. We talked about that last week. And that when Peter found out, uh, when Peter, when Paul came to Peter in Jerusalem for a little while, Saul, Paul was not brought in. Eventually, he was told to go to Tarsus, where he waited until God would call him into ministry. But in the meantime, Peter continued to do ministry there in Samaria. Then he went on and went to Aeneas' house. And uh, Aeneas, who could not walk for like six or eight years, it was a long time, he was able to walk because of the power of God through Peter being there at that moment, and then he went over to, uh, he was told about Dorcas, Tabitha, uh, so he goes over to Lydda where Dorcas is, and she's dead, she's in the upper room dead, they've already washed her body, she's, they're ready to bury her, and he walks in and he says, let's go, come on, come on, get up, and she, he grabs her hand, and when he does, her eyes open up, she sees Peter, and she sits up off the bed, and the dead are raised because of the power of God that, that has that begun to flow through Peter. Don't you want to see the dead raised? Amen. Don't you want to see the miraculous? I'm going to tell you what. Before I care about seeing dead people laying on uh, at, at Andy Walker's, before I care about that, I want to see some of the dead folks in our town raised. I want to see the dead folks that are walking around us saved and brought to life in Jesus Christ. I want to see the power of God begin to surge through our entire community. And then... Well, that's cool. Then we'll just start, we'll create a ministry where one of y'all go down to Andy Walker's every once in a while and try to ruin his business. <laughs> All right? We'll do everything in our power. <laughs> um, we get to the story where he goes back to Jaffa. Jaffa is a beautiful, a gorgeous port city. Uh, it's over the Mediterranean. There is no more beautiful water than the Mediterranean, in my opinion. Uh, it is just, it, it is a gorgeous place. And uh, he's there on right on the seashore, and he's a tanner. He, he's someone who takes uh, dead animals, and he, he you know, cuts all the, the nasty stuff out and everything, and then he's tanning the eyes there. Uh, the wind and the water makes it a good place to tan the eyes there. So uh, Peter is staying at the tanner's house, which is already kind of taboo. Uh, Jewish people should never be at a tanner's house because they deal with dead things, and Jewish people are too good for dead things, all right? So he's there in his house. God's already kind of lowering his shield a little bit. And it says around lunchtime, which is prayer time for Jewish people, it says that he is hungry. Reasonable. It's lunchtime, right? So he tells the people he's working with, he says, hey, I'm hungry. And they say, great, we're going to fix you some food. And he was like, well, I'm so hungry, I can't even look at you while you're eating food. So I'm going to go up on the roof, and I'm going to pray. And I mean that really, because he goes up there and prays, and the scripture says, he goes up there, and all he can think about is food. It says he goes into a trance, which literally in, in the Greek culture, the word there, it doesn't mean like he was in a vision or like he was, you know, he was robotic. He literally had a thought come in his mind and he couldn't think about anything else. And the thought that popped in his mind was that he saw basically, remember, they're on the Mediterranean, so it was a, it was a sailboat sail, like, like uh, the, the sails and on a sailboat. He saw that come out of heaven and it was just filled with pork chops and bacon and shrimp and... Uh, I mean, all the things, I, as a Jewish person, you can't eat those things. Ain't you glad you've been liberated from the law? Hallelujah. All right? As a Jewish person, he couldn't eat those things. And so he sees this coming down, and here's Golden Corral sitting in front of him, and the Lord says, take and eat. And Peter's response to God is, whoa, whoa, I would never touch anything unclean. And God rebukes Peter in this moment and says, don't ever say that something is unclean if I have made it clean. Don't ever say that something is unclean if I have made it clean. That 
That's a really good point. That's a really good point. We do not believe God is in the salvation work if we are thinking that anything that has been unclean will stay unclean. But God is in the redemptive work. He wants to make things better for us. Now, we can look back in history, and how many of y'all in the room know that we, we probably would have done better than not have any pork? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of y'all right now on blood pressure medicine. If you just laid off the bacon, you've been set, right? So it's not like his law was, a, a, was harming anyone. The point of the law was that his people would be set apart and healthy. However... To use the law as a weapon to harm other people, it was never meant to do, which often in the church we do that. We have our rules for each other, and then we mandate it on people on the outside. The pastor preaches about abortion or about uh, uh, premarital uh, 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 intercourse. We, we are hard line on that. We know that to be the case because we want to save everybody we possibly can and hope that no one would ever delve into that. But what ends up happening is what becomes clarity and idealism from the pulpit becomes really, really judgmental and realism. And when you find out that somebody has done something they ought not to do, then we stick our nose up at them as if we're any better than them and we've all failed, right? So should we not be people who, yes, strive every single day to do everything in our power, to do everything we can to serve the Lord and do good? But when those people fall short, which we all do, we have the most amount of grace for them because we understand that every bit that we have done good is only because the Father has given to us. Divorce breaks the heart of God. But the people of God cannot pull away from people in divorce. They must be the grace in the middle of divorce. We must be willing to enter into the muck and the mire just like Jesus did ours. We cannot use our laws in order to keep away from people who are disgusting. Why? Because people are, like, are disgusting. <laughs> if I were to really get to know every single one of you at the most intimate level, every one of us, at least has a past that we'd be embarrassed about. So Paul would talk about this and he'd say, so should we sin more that grace should abound more? Of course not. I'm not saying like it's okay to sin. My point is, is we have no place to judge people who are sinning. We have the place to be the grace. Right. All right. Don't call what God has made clean unclean. So as we catch up in Acts chapter 10, verse 17, he has left Simon the Tanner's house. The Holy Spirit has spoken to Peter, and he says, there are some men coming from Cornelius' house. I want you to go up there, and I want you to minister to some Gentiles. Reminder, this is against the rules. They ain't supposed to talk with. They ain't supposed to be in the house with Gentiles. They ain't supposed to be around them. Gentiles are not cool. And so he says, I want you to go up there. I want you to preach to some Gentiles. Verse 17. Now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed, as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius had made inquiry to Simon's house, stood at the gate, and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Without hesitation. These three men, these three Gentiles are downstairs, and the Holy Spirit says, I want you to go with them without hesitation. Can I, church, let me just help you. When the Holy Spirit speaks to you, don't wait for him to say without hesitation. That's what he means. Okay. Delayed obedience is disobedience. Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. Okay. You don't bring Gentiles into your house. And it's not even Peter's house. He invited these Gentiles into Simon the Tanner's house. He's breaking the rules. It's not even being a good guest. He's hosting these guys. The next day he arose and went away with them. Some of the brothers from Joppa. I want you to listen to that. He took some of the brothers from Joppa, some of the Jewish brothers 
from Joppa accompanied him, and on the following day they entered Caesarea, Maritima. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up, saying, Stand up, I too am a man. And as he talked with him, he, he went in and found many persons gathered, and he said to them, You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. This is not a good preamble. I'm just going to say, hey, don't ever go to somebody's house and open up with that, you know. Y'all know how it is, how disgusting. I mean, I'm a lofty Christian and I'm coming to your house. I'm just saying, you, know, just, you should be blessed. Just hold that out. <laughs> you yourselves know how lawful it is for you to associate and visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I sent for you, I came without, so when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked with then why you sent for me. And Cornelius said, Four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house at the ninth hour, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing, and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms have been remembered. Alms is, is your giving, your offerings. Your alms have been remembered before God. Send, therefore, to Joppa, and ask for Simon, who was called Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner by the sea in Joppa. Thirty miles north is Caesarea Maritima, which is where these guys were. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. So Peter opened his mouth and said... Now, opened his mouth is just, it's a very clear way that Peter was beginning to preach, okay? Instead of Jesus, often they would talk about Jesus, and Jesus opened his mouth to teach. And so, this is a, this is a different posture from greeting and talking, and then Peter now is in preacher mode. He opens his mouth to teach, and this is what he preaches. And I want you to hear some of the phrases in here. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. This is a Jewish man taught Jewish laws that everything God wanted was only for the Jewish people. And now he understands that God shows no partiality. I want you to underline that. Because often in our churches, in our lives, we think that God shows some level of partiality. That he only gives his best gifts to his best kids, that he only blesses the ministry of those that he's really impressed with, when we forget that the entire reason we have a ministry is for the fulfillment of the mission to take place. God is not blessed based on his servants. He is basing it on the people who are there to receive from it. And the Lord expands your ministry. You best be on your best behavior because he ain't doing it for you. He's doing it for you to be a blessing to someone else. I tell you that today to say because when men of God stay in the pool and we think they're great men of God because their numbers have increased. Oh, beware, for God will reveal the sins in their life eventually. And the wider the platform, the larger the fall. And what most people do is they fall away because they start following a man instead of the Lord in which they, he has been proclaiming. God is not blessing you because of your diligence. He is blessing you because of his love. He is not blessing you because of your righteousness. Your righteousness is as filthy rags. God shows no partiality. He does not bless one man because he speaks gooder than another man. We must be understanding that it's the presence of God that makes things great. If this church were to grow to 3,000, it would never be because of me. It's because of the presence of God moving upon us. And if he were to dwell, dwindle us down to three, I would hope also that wouldn't be my fault. <laughs> the presence of God is what we must lean into and lean on. God shows no partiality. So when the Lord chooses someone, we must be willing to be grateful. No matter who it is. Now this is the chapter after Saul. Saul has just been changed and nobody in Jerusalem even liked the boy. Peter couldn't even get along with Saul. And now he's at Cornelius' house saying God shows no partiality. Now Cornelius was a righteous and devout man. Saul was a murderer. Church, I know the dividing line in our eyes sometimes is who is fundamentalist enough? 
If someone is willing to wear something that's uncomfortable in your eyes, you think they're unsaved. If someone is willing to drink something that you deem is incorrect, you're wondering if they're saved. If someone lets words slip out of their mouth that you would never want to hear on TV, you wonder if there's salvation in the house. But I want to let you know there's no partiality. Does that mean that God doesn't care about sin? Of course not. He wants us to be holy. He wants us to be perfect. He wants us to move forward. What is not on our job to do is to judge. Now, if someone has fruit that you do not want to harvest, you do not have to spend your days with that person. If someone is a gossiper, you do not get to tell them they're going to hell, but you do get to remove yourself from their company. If someone cusses and you hate to hear cuss words, you're allowed to distance yourself. But I tell you also, the more you distance yourself from those who do things that you do not appreciate, you are also removing your influence. Be strong and courageous, therefore. Be strong and courageous. If you are weak, remove yourself. But if you are able to be the stronger brother, then recuse yourself from the things that would harm others. For God shows no partiality. There is no one that he does not wish. It is his will that none should perish. Amen. Not one. Truly, I understand that God shows no partiality. That phrase actually comes from Moses. Moses mentions this in chapter 16 of Deuteronomy, that God shows no partiality. The very man that the Jewish people for a thousand years based their racism on, which was Moses. Moses himself said that God is the God of everyone. He holds no partiality. He has just chosen the people of Abraham because he had to start somewhere. And I'm going to, I'm going to explain that to you in just a second. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. He is Lord of all. Peter's mind has been changed. He is no longer the Lord of the Jews. He is no longer the Lord of Israel. He is the Lord of all. In this moment, his sermon changes. He's not just Jehovah. He is Christ. He is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John proclaimed. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth in the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. For God was with him. And we are witnesses of all that he, uh, all that he did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a cross. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear, not to all people, not to all the people, but to us who have been chosen as God's witnesses who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Peter is in the introduction to his sermon. As I am right now. <laughs> he hadn't even got to the scripture yet. He hadn't even said turn open your Bibles to such and such. Or Google this chapter. He didn't say anything of that nature yet. He's literally giving the preamble to his sermon. While Peter was saying these things. The Holy Spirit fell. The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among them, the circumcised, who had come with Peter, were amazed. That's why he brought the boys from Joppa. Because he needed someone to corroborate the story. And the Old Testament, in order to make sure that your story was correct, you needed two or three witnesses. So he brought six. And boy's good at math. I'm going, to bring, I'm, going to, I'm going to multiply it and make sure that I've got enough folks to see it. The believers from the, um, from the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because of the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. That then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water from baptizing these people? Who can receive the Holy Spirit just as we have? 
He commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. If you go into chapter 11, it goes on and he eventually leaves Cornelius' house after several days of ministry to them. And as soon as he gets to Jerusalem, some brothers in Jerusalem immediately meet him at the door and goes, I heard you were in a Gentile's house. What is wrong with you? Read it. Chapter 11. Not right now, but tomorrow. How dare you go to the Gentile's house? And Peter walks in with the brothers from Joppa. He walks in and he says, you don't know what took place while I was there. I began to preach to them, and the same presence of God that fell upon us when we were in the upper room fell among the Gentiles, and they spoke in tongues, and they began to extol God. Do you know when God evidences himself in a powerful way like that, there's nothing you can say to these things. You can stay as dogmatic as you absolutely want to, but there's nothing that will change what God has done. Now listen, when the power of God moves, there's a part of me, there's a little, there's a little part of me that wants a glimpse of the early 90s. I want to see people dancing in this, in this altar. I want to see shouting. I want to see people clapping and running around this place. I want to see Jericho marches. I want to see, I want to see someone like my Aunt Ruth sitting right over there singing in tongues. I'll never forget that night. Singing, singing the worship song in tongues. Just as beautiful. You know, God wants to do a new thing. And if I demand him to do it the way I experienced it as a child... I may miss out. What I need to be open to is that if the same Holy Spirit that would fall upon me when I was that little wants to fall down in a completely different way, what is the difference? What, what is the, the marker is the presence of God? Whatever God wants to do is what I want to see God do. There's a good place for an amen, but we'll wait. Okay. Whatever the presence of God calls us to do, I'm telling you right now, the thing that you need to understand is that when people begin to worship the Lord, even when they worship different than you, that's the marker that the presence of God is on the move. Because of sin in our life, it is unnatural to worship God. So when people begin to worship God, even when it's music you don't like, when people get to worship God, even when the movement looks different than what you grew up on. When people begin to worship God and people are coming and declaring that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the marker that the presence of God is in the room. John said that no one can say Lord, Lord, unless the Holy Spirit gives the ability. Jew, Gentile, male, female, poor, rich. Powerful, weak. When people begin to declare that God, Jesus, is Lord, that is the marker of the presence of God on the move. Now, I want to talk to you very quickly about the significance of, of this little phrase here. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those that heard the word. Now, that word fell is epipito. It's in the... I mean, you wouldn't be able to read it anyway, so I just put it in cursive up there. Epipito. Okay, that's how, it, that's how it, it's in Greek. It means embrace. Now, Luke writes this word both in the story in chapter 10 when the Spirit fell on the Gentiles, and he writes it in chapter 11 when Paul, when Peter is explaining to these Jewish brothers that God has embraced the prodigal. Now, I want you to understand, when he, Luke only uses this word like four times. Two is when the Holy Spirit fell. One of those times is back in Luke chapter 15 when we talked about the, the story of the prodigal son. You know the story of the prodigal? The prodigal tells his dad, you're not dying fast enough. And he says, can I have my inheritance now? He goes out and wastes his, and wastes his inheritance in a far off country, in a far off country, in a far off country. And while he wastes in a far off country, he finds himself in a pigsty, which is the most abhorrent thing that Jewish people could ever understand. And while he's ready to eat the slop out of the, the pigsty, he decides to go back home. 
And it says that the father is waiting up front, waiting for the child to come back. And he runs out. You remember the words? It says, and he falls, falls on him. He embraces his son. Do you remember the words there? He had his speech. Remember? He goes up there and he's written it down in his hand. He's going to read it to his dad. I know I'm not worthy to be your son. I'll come back and be your servant. I just, I hate to be gone. He's got this whole thing. And the scripture says that when he comes back, he says, I know I have failed you. And the father falls on him while he's still speaking. The father falls on him in the same way that he did with Peter. This is a picture that from the very beginning, when God created humanity, his heart was that all mankind would be his. He was not seeking out the Jews because he loved them more. He was seeking out the Jews because none of us loved God the way he loved us. For centuries, reading Genesis, for centuries he poured out his spirit. And poured out his spirit, warning people, but no one would come to him. And so after hundreds of years of trying, after the flood that wiped all of humanity out, and still Noah couldn't even remain righteous for a season, he came to, he came to Abraham. And he blessed him because of his righteousness? No. He blessed Abraham because of his faith? No. He blessed Abraham because he loved him. I know Hebrews talks about Abraham's faith, but his faith wasn't before the promise. His faith came after he was promised. And what did God promise Abraham? He promised him, number one, he promised him the land. He said, Abraham, the land that I'm sending you to, it will be for your descendants. Do you understand that Paul, that uh, Abraham never owned an inch of Canaan? Isaac never owned an inch of Canaan. Jacob never owned an inch of Canaan. 400 years of history, they never owned anything. They did not own any of that piece of land until Moses led them out. Moses never owned an inch of Canaan. He never owned any of Israel. But it wasn't until the, the Joshua took over the land that they took it, that was a promise fulfilled. <coughs> he also told Abraham that I will make your descendants as many as possible. I, that, that, that you will not even count the stars and it would match with how many young people that be, how many people come from your line. And so he increases his descendants. And then he makes one more comment. He says, you will be a blessing to the whole world. I will bless the whole world through you. And that was the promise of Jesus Christ. Jesus did not, God did not hold himself off to only the Jews for 1,500 years. He extended himself and extended himself and extended himself and finally decided, I'm going to start with one and I'm going to do everything I possibly can to bless the whole world through the one. And has he not done that? Do you not sit in this room today blessed because of the promise of Abraham? I want you to understand that the Gentiles, they got to be blessed with, they were blessed with the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit, without the sign of Abraham's promise. The promise of the Father was given without the sign that was given to Abraham. Do you remember what the sign that was given to Abraham was? Uncomfortable. Men, if you came to the Lord later in your life, you should be grateful that we did not require surgery for you to become a member. Abraham's sign was uncomfortable. And now the sign, the evidence of the Spirit of God is speaking in tongues. It's a unified language. Something that will always edify you and can be, not be really verified by anybody else. You know if you've been filled with the Spirit. And that's what unifies us. But we're unified under the presence and the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> the unified speech. Now that's what I'm, that's that's the big point. Maybe you had got it here, so I'm gonna try it again. This story is the story of us. From the very beginning, it was his desire that there would never be a time where we were far from the Lord, yet we were. God drops the Holy Spirit upon the, the Jews in chapter two, but it's in chapter ten. 
that he embraces us like the prodigal. Jesus was talking about the Holy Spirit when he told the prodigal son story. The embrace of those that are far off. Remember, Acts chapter 2, verse 38 or 9, it says, this is for you and your children. He's talking to Jewish people. And then he says, and to all that are far off. He includes us in every single marker here. He just wanted us from day one. It was his design that we would never be far off, but we chose to be. And he was from the very beginning creating a plan where we could be all back together in one family. Him being the father, we being the children, and heirs to the throne. We are in right standing with God. We are not secondary to the Jewish people because of the blood of Christ. Jesus' blood, the atonement and the anointing and the, and the family uh, fellowship comes from the blood of Christ. And without it, we have nothing. And with it, we have everything. So what do we say these things? The Old Testament is our backstory, But we're the future. The gospel is for all. Every single person that you think is out of the reach of God. The Holy Spirit desires. God desires. Anyone in this room who's ever had a child that has been afar off, you know your heart has always been to be restored. Our heart breaks. Parents, your heart breaks when you can't get through to your child. Can you imagine can you imagine the pleasure of God in the moment when the Spirit fell upon the Gentiles and He was able to embrace them for the first time in, in centuries? Can you imagine the pleasure of God in that moment, the joy of God? We always think of it from our perspective. Thank God He fell on us. Yes, that's wonderful. But nothing had ever fulfilled God in the entire history of the world like the moment He got to embrace the prodigals once again. And this was the powerful thing about it. Was that in Jerusalem, they were tortured. But everywhere they went in Europe, there, the doors flung open and people began to believe in Jesus Christ. It was time those who had been afar off for so long had finally tasted the presence of God. And the fire began to snap and the passion began to build. Pentecostals, people who have been in church a long time, let me remind you, do not get complacent. For the revival may always take place among those who are afar off. Every single movement of God has gotten stale because the people have gotten complacent. Let it not be said of us. Yes. Let us keep the fire on the burner. May we continue to go after the Gentiles. Maybe you are saying to yourself that I don't know what else to do. I've prayed. I've fasted. I've come to church every single week. I've served in missionettes for 37,000 years. I've, I've tithed every single week of my life. I've, I've done everything I've ever do. You've been called to do one thing. Tell the world about the good news of Jesus. Who's with you today because you told them about what Jesus has done for you? Where's your Mediterranean rim? Where's your European churches? Where are the people that you're burdened for? Who does your heart break for? What group of people do you think would never listen to you? Saul was a murderer, a Jewish murderer, and he went to like Corinth. You don't know much about Corinth, but it was a vulgar place. It was like going to Williamson or something. <laughs> now, Corinth really would have been like going to Las Vegas. It'd be like going to Las Vegas, and Paul goes there, Saul goes there, and sees what he can do to, to see if he can get anybody to believe in Jesus. And then they do. They believe in Jesus. It's a powerful move, like a revival takes place in Corinth. And then we get these really long letters there. You want to know why? Because people who don't know Jesus are really difficult. 
And sometimes it takes a lot of discipleship to get people where they need to be. And we need to be patient and willing to do that for them. Yes, if somebody who's never been a believer comes into this place, they might be different than you. They might be more raw. They might say things you would never say. They may confess things in front of you because they've received a freedom through the Holy Spirit. And you may wonder to yourself, how in the world did someone ever walk into this place? And the question is, how could that offend you? Do you have you forgotten where you've come from? Have you forgotten what God has saved you from? Where do you deserve to be? Everybody, God has called to embrace. So I want you to know, don't, don't stop leaning in. Receive the Holy Spirit today. Breathe in Him. Be grateful that you have received the presence of God. Understand how long of a plan it took to finally get us in. Prodigals, everyone under prodigals, we do have a Father that loves us who had been sitting for a long time watching the road, hoping to one day embrace us again. And now he has. And our marker is not this brick and mortar. Our marker is not the Jesus fish on the back of our vehicles. Our marker is the presence of God. And if we will walk and obey we're going to see the miraculous take place because God will be with us. We do not deserve the presence of God. How dare us ever get into a posture where we feel entitled. You remember that's what the older brother thought, right? How dare my dad throw this party for the little brother when I've been here the whole time. May we never feel entitled to the presence of God. He gives to who he wishes. And with God there is no partiality. Amen. The purpose of God in creation was to have people who would give him glory. The promise of Abraham was to have people who would give him glory. The power of the Holy Spirit has been offered to all of us in order to give God glory. The same writer who wrote the prodigal son and chapter 10 of Acts. He also wrote chapter 11. How much more will your Father in Heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Can we receive Him again today? Thank you for joining the Askeville Assembly of God Sermon Podcast. For more information on our ministry, please visit our website at askevilleassembly.com.